two questions about adjusting the suspensions of these cars you can get 10 different answers if you ask five different guys fueled by my work here on youtube i'm regularly offered to drive friends 911s and i found they all behave differently and what is even worse most of them handled better than mine I could have gone to a specialist company with some laser beam spaceship equipment, but I've been there before and experiences weren't great. As much as I'm concerned, the only way to really get the hang of it is doing it with my own hands and some traditional gear. And so I adjusted all the suspension settings with a cheap level, a line, a self-made rack and some good advice from a master mechanic. My 911 now handles light years better than before. In fact, I think it's perfect. The steering was a defining characteristic oh. of any of the generations of 911. It's about how it feels. Of course, Hammond is right. So what are we talking about? As these pictures of my childhood RC car demonstrate, changing the height has an influence on the angles of the wheels related to the ground. And as many of us have lowered their cars, but only few have adjusted the settings, I dare to say that a lot of 911s out there don't drive as well as they could. First, there's the camber. The basic idea is to put as much rubber on the road as possible and that obviously means the camber is zero when the car goes straight. However, cars roll in corners and that means that traditional suspensions force them to run on the edges of the tires. If you give it some negative camber in the first place, you can get a bigger contact patch in corners when it rolls, which is where we want it. And also the steering response is more crisp. Porsche still suggests zero degrees, but guys who race their cars, I heard, go to even minus two. Next there is the toe angle. A negative toe points outwards, and that simply means all kinds of bumps will make the car move away from the center line. That's not what we want, so the toe must be positive. Porsche suggests a toe of 0.25 degrees, which appears to be a compromise between good centering, but yet not too much tire wear. Finally, the one parameter with the greatest influence on steering experience and at the same time the one which is the most complicated to adjust is the caster. It defines how much the steering axis is inclined towards the center line of the wheel and it's therefore responsible for the force that is required to turn the wheel back into its centered position. I had asymmetric caster at my front wheels and it was about 15% off and that was the reason why I was so unhappy with the car's handling. Now, as we saw earlier, all the essential parameters of wheel geometry somehow depend on the height of the body and that's why positioning the car properly is where it all starts. And I know what you're thinking. He needs a wheel load scale. Um, no he doesn't. I mean, if you're willing to spend the money, just do it. But if you take a little care that left and right side are equally high, let's say to a millimeter, your 911 will certainly be within the bounds of a well-balanced car. Lifting and lowering the car is easy at the front. At the stern it isn't. It's that complicated that I'll dedicate an extra film to it later this year.
I have my car on a height of 635 millimeters over ground, measured from the top of the wheel arch, front and rear. And with that settled, let's bear down on the front suspension. Opening these three cylinder screws allows shifting the strut, except it doesn't. The sealant Porsche used isn't flexible and that means one first has to remove it before the actual work can begin. If in your car you find this material in the gap between body and strut, caster and camber have never been adjusted and likely they aren't correct. At this point the question is raised about how to measure things. This is a cheap electronic level that I bought on Amazon. It has a precision of 0.1 degrees and that makes it a tool sufficiently accurate for the job I'm doing here because all the quantities I need to measure have a tolerance of about twice as high. As you can see here it keeps working in a rather broad range of angles perpendicular to the one I'm measuring. For those of you with the doubtful minds, the measurement shown is plausible because the panels of my workshop wall aren't entirely even. Now, people tend to think that if a system is labeled laser, it is very precise. Uh, here's for instance the result of the last laser guided alignment of a so-called 9-11 specialist workshop that I paid for adjusting the toe of my targa. Now that all said, let's get this done. If mass weights down on the strut, the bearing cannot be shifted, so one can either lift it, shift it, lower it, measure, lift it, shift it. You see where I'm going. I therefore made me these wood wedges. Workshops of grown-ups use racks that attach to the rim, but my Magic Master Mechanic says that if the rim is straight, the tire will be straight, and there's some reason in this statement. Of course, one has to stay clear from the tire bead. I did some basic adjustment of the camber while the wheel was still lifted, then weighted it and did the fine tuning. 0.4 to 0.5 degrees appeared like a good compromise between handling and tire temperature. Moving on to the caster. At university I learned, and forgot, so I googled it, that the camber at a certain steering angle plus the camber at the opposite steering angle multiplied by a factor gives the caster. And if you think about it, it's kind of obvious that those two angles are related by some geometrical function. This function is not linear, so the certain factor only works if you apply it to a certain steering angle and not to any steering angle. That said, the measurement procedure says to get the caster, the camber is measured at steering angles of 20 degrees in both directions. Both angles are added and multiplied by 1.5.
The value suggested by Porsche for the caster is 6 degrees and 5 minutes, which I guess is their way of saying they really mean 6, not 5, not 7. They allow a rather generous half degree difference between left and right, so with my 0.3 I'm well within the tolerance, even if I add the inaccuracy of the level. Now, if it crosses your mind that all this formula thing sounds a bit adventurous, I have to admit, you're right. Therefore, before I even started, I looked whether a direct measurement would conform to the schoolbook method. And guess what? University and Google were right. However, one can create any result wanted by directly placing the level with its even measuring surface on the curved strut. So a platform was needed, which I built of modeling clay. All these years the caster of the suspension was 0.8 degrees at the left and even about 1 degree more at the right. No surprise that this car wouldn't handle properly. Let's move on to the toe angle and first thing I do is to check where the left and right side are aligned symmetrically. I use the front ends of the front and rear wheel as reverence points and then measure the distance between the line and the rear end of the front tire. The value for the toe angle is supposed to be 15 minutes, that is 0.25 degrees, and Porsche allows a tolerance of 5 minutes. Accordingly, the rear side of the rear tire roughly is 2.5 millimeters further outwards than the front side. 2.5 millimeters on a track gauge of about 1.4 meters isn't an accuracy that makes us tremble with fear. Despite this, I built me a rack to make things more comfortable and decent. Not much of a surprise, the toe angle of my car was already adjusted properly because looking for the issue that spoiled its handling, like Captain Renault, I had rounded up the usual suspects and adjusted it before. Don't forget that the result you measure with the rack, if you do it the way I showed it, contains the toe-in of both wheels, so you have to divide it by two.
Anyway, in order to get this done, you need to open this nut and turn the tie rod till you're able to measure the right value. When I look back on this project, I'm excited about a number of things really. The first and most important, the difference it makes to have a well-adjusted front suspension and a somehow kind of okay one is very significant. When I ride it today, it's about as satisfying as new dampers or tires. Before I took the time to look into this, I thought that it's all terribly complex and requires expensive tools and everything. It's not like that at all. And finally, it's a rewarding experience to say I put the handling straight.